All right, this video is going to talk about a hypothesis test for the difference between two means. The idea here is very simple. We have two totally different samples. Uh, one has a mean uh, one, one has a mean two. We have two different means, right? Two different samples, two different populations that those samples came from. And we want to know, is there a difference between them? And you have to understand that the basis of statistics says that there's always going to be a difference. There's always going to be a difference between two things because the world just varies. Our job in a hypothesis test is to determine is that difference significant or not, or is it just a small difference that doesn't really tell us anything meaningful, and that's the simple idea. Now, we do have the same four steps to run a hypothesis step. Step one is your hypothesis. The null is always a negative statement, so we assume that there is absolutely no difference between the populations, and the alternative is that there is a difference, and you must decide which way by reading the problem. So let's just show how we would do that. The null would be that the average for population one is equal to the average for population two, right? The two means are exactly the same. We could say that there is no difference by saying that when we subtract them, right, that's how you find a difference, we get zero, but by saying there is no difference, it's the same thing as saying that the two means are the same. And the alternative would be that one particular mean, one, one proportion, right, or I'm sorry, not proportion, one population mean is actually greater than the other, or maybe um, one is um, less than the other, or maybe they're just not equal. Maybe I don't care if one's smaller than the other, but I just care that there is a difference. And if there is a not equal to sign, that's when you just have to double the p-value at the end. All right, check our conditions. These conditions should all sound very familiar. Both samples must be random. Both samples must be less than 10% of the population. Now, to be big enough, we need both samples to be 30 or larger. That's the central limit theorem. That tells us that we're big enough to use the normal model. Or if we're under 30, we do have to check the samples and make sure there's no outliers or skewness, and we'll talk about that as well. Don't forget that fourth condition when you're working with two samples. That means that the two samples must be independent of each other. All right, step three is to work to find your p-value. Now, when we're working with um, means, we do have to use t, so we want to find a t-score. To find your t-score, you're going to take an observed difference. I'll write that as OBS diff, right? The observed difference minus, well, remember, we assume in a hypothesis test that there is absolutely no difference. So we assume that there is no difference or zero. And we're going to divide that by our standard error of the difference. Right? So how do we find that standard error of the difference? Well, that's a little bit of a tricky formula, but we did talk about it in the confidence interval video. Basically, the standard error for the first sample is S1 divided by the square root of your sample size. And the um, other sample had a standard deviation of 2, or a, I'm sorry, a standard deviation S2 to represent the other sample, and divide that by the square root of that sample size. But remember, these are standard errors. We're not allowed to add standard errors, just like we can't add standard deviation. So we're going to square both of these guys. If we square them, we get variance. Then we could add that variance together, and then square root to get back to a standard deviation. So that gives us a giant square root of S1 squared divided by just just n1 because the square root canceled, <clears throat> plus s2 squared divided by sample size 2. Once again, the square root canceled there on the bottom. Now, if you watch the video over proportions first, you have to do what we call pooling in proportions. With samples, means, you never have to worry about pooling. Just use this formula right here. No big deal. Very, very simple. All right. Now, when we make our conclusions, we have to Think about the p-value, right? If the p-value is above alpha, we fail to reject the null. This means that there is not significant evidence for the alternative. Uh, basically, we're just saying that, you know what, we might have observed a difference, but it just wasn't big enough to really tell us anything important. If the p-value is less than alpha, then we reject the null. Rejecting the null means that there is significant difference or significant evidence for the alternatives. We're saying, wow, there really is a difference between these two sample um, populations, okay? All right, so here's the problem of the day that we're going to do, and we're going to show you exactly how to do on these problems with this idea. Does taking a calcium pill reduce blood pressure? A well-designed experiment had a group of 10 people take a calcium pill each day for 12 weeks, and the group showed a mean drop in blood pressure by 5 points. So their blood pressure, on average, went down 5 points, with a standard deviation of 8.743. A second group of 11 people took a placebo each day for 12 weeks and a mean drop of negative 
0.273. Now, the fact that it's negative means that for the group that was on the placebo, their blood pressure actually went up because a drop of a negative would be a positive. That would be their blood pressure actually went up. But it also had a standard deviation of 5.901. Does this experiment show strong evidence that calcium does reduce blood pressure? Well, if we just look at these two numbers alone, the people on the calcium had an average drop of five points. That sounds great. The people on a placebo increased their blood pressure. Well, you know, it's just two samples. That doesn't get necessarily mean anything until we conduct one of these hypotheses tests. So, here we go. Step one is our hypothesis. The null hypothesis is that the calcium true average is equal to the placebo true average. Now notice I'm using mu here. The hypotheses always use mu because you're referencing the true values. Now we're just using samples to try to make an inference about these true values. Notice I used a little c there and a little p there to represent the calcium and the placebo. Personalizing a little bit. So I am going to write down that c is the calcium group and average of p here is the placebo group. And remember this is the um, the <coughs> average drop, the average drop, the mean drop. And the alternative is that we want the calcium to definitely be greater than the placebo, right? We want to show that the people taking the calcium had a much higher drop in blood pressure than the group on the placebo. Conditions, both samples were randomly selected. Both samples had to be less than 10% of the population. Neither sample is big enough, so we do have to check the data. So I conveniently did that for you here. Just so you guys are aware, where I got all these numbers from, is I actually got my data. So list one here represents the calcium. So we had one person that dropped by seven, one person that actually gained four points, one person dropped 18, one person dropped 17. So again, a positive is a good thing. That means they drop blood pressure. A negative means their blood pressure actually went up. So even in the first group on the calcium, I did have some positives and some negatives. Um, list two here is my placebo group. There was the 10 people on the, or the 11 people in the placebo group. And again, some of them, um, dropped and some of them increased. Again, negatives mean that their blood pressure actually went up. So um, just showing you guys that the data is there. Now, I actually want to check this data, right? So I'm going to go to second y equals. I'm going to go to plot one, make sure it's on, highlight the little histogram here, and I'm going to look at list one first. So zoom, nine is my zoom stat. And again, I don't see any major outliers. I don't see any major skewness. I mean, it doesn't look perfectly normal, but again, it doesn't look like anything much. I don't see anything that's going to tell me that I shouldn't be moving on. And I am going to check out list two real quick. So I'm going to go back to my stat plot, check out list two. So I'm going to just change this to list two. And this is my placebo group. And I'm going to do zoom nine again, because this is new data. And once again, I don't see any major. In fact, this actually does look approximately normal. No major outliers, no major skewness. So I am good to go. Now, I also want to show you how I actually got all of my numbers. If I run a one variable stats on list one, <coughs> this does show that for the calcium group had an average drop of five points. Standard deviation was the um, 8.743 that I told you it was. And then if we look at list two real quick here, stat, calc, and then we'll go to list two. This is the placebo group. They had an average drop of negative 0.273. If you recall, I said that. Standard deviation was 5.901. So you can get all those data, all that numbers from your calculator. All right, now as for my work here. Step three, the work. Well, the first thing I need is to kind of organize myself. So I had the, I called this the active group, meaning the active ingredient. I should actually put a, a C there for calcium. It makes a lot more sense. There's a C there. So the average calcium was 5 points. Standard deviation average for the placebo was at negative 0.273 standard deviation. So the first thing I need is an observed difference. So I'm going to take the 5.00 minus the negative 0.273 and that gives me a uh, 5.273 difference, right? So I saw a 5.273 difference. So the group on the, on the calcium on average was 5.273 blood pressure points better, right? Or, or in terms of better, I mean lower. Now how about standard error? Now notice I used my formula here. Took the standard deviation for the calcium squared divided by the calcium size 10 plus the standard deviation for the placebo group squared divided by the size of the 11 for the um, calcium. And I'm going to go ahead and use on my calculator giant square root and you set up parentheses for the 8.743 squared divided by 10 close that parenthesis off plus another set of parentheses for the 5.901 squared divided by 11 
Close all that off, I get 3.288. 8, 3.288, 3.288. And my degrees of freedom, by the way, how do you figure out degrees of freedom? Well, in this sample right here, I had 9 degrees of freedom. In this sample right here, I had 10 degrees of freedom. So that's a total of 19 degrees of freedom. Hopefully that was pretty easy to understand. Now I need a T-score, right? I had an observed difference of 5.273 minus, I'm assuming that, in a test, there's absolutely no difference at all. I want to see how far away is from no difference is the difference I observed. Divided by my standard error here of 0.3288. Sorry for a little messiness there. So 5.273 minus 0 is obviously 5.273. Uh, and I'm going to divide that by 3.288. And I get a T score of 1.6037. Now, to get my p-value, I am going to have to use a t-cdf, uh, and I'm going to look above because it's a positive t-score, so 1.6037 to 99. Comma, I need to put in my degrees of freedom, so I'm going to put in the 19 degrees of freedom there, and I get a p-value of 0.0626. Now, I'm not going to double this p-value because, remember, my only concern was that calcium did better. Well, unfortunately, that's not a very, very low p-value. So now, to make my conclusion, on basing this on a p-value of 0.0626, I'm going to have to, you know, that is greater than 0.05, my typical alpha, I will fail to reject. And now I want to give some context to that. I will fail to reject and all. There is no evidence, or at least no significant evidence, it can't hurt to add that word significant in there. We like that word. There is no significant evidence that calcium will lower blood pressure. Now, you have to understand that most kids at this point want to say, but wait a minute, wait a minute. The data showed that the calcium kids or the calcium group did lower their blood pressure. Well, yes. But what I'm trying to say is that the evidence isn't strong enough. It did lower it, but it just wasn't enough evidence for me to tr be truly convinced that it's a significant enough lowering for me to say, hey, calcium will, in fact, lower blood pressure. So unfortunately, I need more data, right? I'm going to have to do this test again, probably with better replication instead of 10 and 11, maybe 200 people in each group. The idea is, yes, I know I saw a difference, but you guys have to understand, every time you look at two samples, you're going to see a difference. It's just a matter of, is that difference because of, hey, natural variation, everything in the world varies, or is there a difference because of the calcium? And even though I did did see that 5.273 difference in between my two samples. It's just not significant enough for me to claim that calcium really does lower blood pressure. So hopefully everything is really kind of making sense to you and that the formulas are all kind of pretty easy to work with and you can flow through these problems pretty simple. So um, hopefully you guys have any issues. We could talk about it in class. Talk to you guys later.